So at the moment, we don't know if these drugs are going to make a major impact in early breast cancer. Patients who have their surgery, and then we're aiming to cure them of their disease. So a number of trials are ongoing with these agents as we speak. With palbociclib, the PALACE trial is very well through its recruitment phase. And with abemaciclib, the Monarch E study is looking in patients at higher risk who have four or more positive nodes, or if one to three nodes have a large tumor or a grade three tumor, or a tumor with a high proliferation key 67 index. These are patients in the early breast cancer setting who we know have only an 80% chance of being free of disease at five years. In other words, 20% of those patients will relapse despite the best current treatment. So the Monarch E trial, which will recruit 4,500 patients, is going to address the question in these higher risk patients whether they benefit from the addition of abemaciclib, which will be given for two years in addition to the endocrine therapy compared to endocrine therapy alone. The trial is well under its way in recruitment and we expect to get data that will be really important in clinical practice to see whether these agents can cure more breast cancer in the early operable setting. But the data won't be available for a few years yet. As we think about tumors that express both the estrogen receptor as well as HER2, we know that cyclin D1 is certainly a critical factor uh, that accepts input from the upstream uh, signaling pathways. There's actually data that goes back well over 10 years demonstrating that in uh, preclinically that in ER positive HER2 positive breast cancer that cyclin D1 is an important target that, uh, that when uh, it is knocked down uh, that we see profound anti-tumor effects uh, in ER positive HER2 positive breast cancer. So therefore, it really does make sense if we think about targeting um, the uh, cyclin D, cyclin uh, uh, CDK4-6 uh, cyclin D access, that we would not only target it with a CDK4-6 inhibitor, uh, but we would also target with uh, a drug that targets estrogen receptor, and we would also target the HER2 pathway. And certainly there are uh, quite excellent preclinical data demonstrating uh, this approach, but also there are some very exciting clinical data that have been observed, that is in patients that uh, have been ER that have ER positive HER2 positive disease have been quite refractory. We've seen responses to single agent abemaciclib, but also uh, there are now data that have been generated uh, where we've combined CDK4-6 inhibitors along with trastuzumab and pertuzumab, along with endocrine therapy, and we're seeing uh, quite robust uh, responses. There are a number of clinical trials that are actually ongoing in the metastatic setting. Uh, there is the uh, PATINA trial, uh, which is looking at the, uh, the role of uh, palbociclib in ER positive, HER2 positive breast cancer. Uh, there's the uh, uh, a study with uh, abemaciclib in combination with fulvestran for ER positive, HER2 positive breast cancer. And so I think we're going to be getting some data very soon that will allow us some further insight into the role of targeting uh, uh, the CDK4-6 cyclin D1 pathway in ER positive or 2 positive breast cancer. Can we even do better? Can we think about triplet therapy in the metastatic setting? You know, with an endocrine agent plus a CDK4-6 inhibitor now having median progression-free survival first line of two plus years, that's the best data we have across all of metastatic breast cancer. What can we add? What are the mechanisms of resistance that come up? What can we add to that to do even, even better? And um, there are data now with the triplet adding an mTOR inhibitor, Evrolimus, um, to CDK4-6 and endocrine therapy. And there's some good safety data and some evidence of, of benefit. You know, and that's actually being looked at in patients who are progressing on a CDK4-6 inhibitor, keep them going and add in the mTOR inhibitor, you know, for example. But even more interesting to me is doing it up front, you know, because we know PI3 kinase um, pathway can be a mechanism of escape to CDK4-6 inhibitors, so add it up front. Same with the PI3 kinase inhibitors. Add them as well to CDK4-6 and endocrine uh, therapy. And then very intriguingly are the checkpoint inhibitors. You have a single agent's late line 
there's a low level of activity of checkpoint inhibitors, you know, the anti-PD-1, anti-PD-L1 agents, you know, particularly um, pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, and druvalumab. You know, there is some benefit in ER positive, but we really need to get that much earlier. And uh, p combinations are going to be very important. A very important nature paper by Goal at Al that looked at um, CDK4-6 inhibitors and found that they inhibit T regulatory cells, which could inhibit the function of CD8 cytolytic T cells. And also, the CDK4-6 inhibitors, they increase endogenous retroviruses, um, and they, it looks to the cancer cell that there is cytoplasmic DNA from these, from activation of these endogenous retroviruses, and that actually increases a um, type 1 or type 3 interferon response and attracts in cytolytic CD, CD8 cells. So the CDK4-6 neighbors have a couple of different mechanisms of actions where they can make the breast cancers more immunogenic. And so there's a lot of interest in studies ongoing combining the checkpoint inhibitors with CDK4-6 inhibitors. A study that Sarah Hurwitz did a preoperative abemocyclib with anastrozole actually showed in some patients that they went from sort of being a desert with regard to tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and after 16 weeks or so of abemocyclib, some of the cancers showed substantial infiltration of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Quite, quite interesting, and that's what the, the Nature Goal paper would suggest. So that's a very, very promising um, area. There are other um, agents in phase three trials in ER positive disease, such as the HDAC inhibitor and tinistat. You know, if that is a positive trial uh, ongoing, that will be another candidate, you know, for example, because we need to probably look at various triplet therapies to see what's going to make the most sense to try to then go into the first line setting and try to get, you know, up to three, four years median progression-free survival.